This is the MyHeart.net podcast. This show is produced by Dr. Philip Johnson in conjunction with VitalEngine.com. Please welcome your host, Dr. Alain Bouchard, a cardiology specialist of Birmingham, Alabama, at St. Vincent's Medical Center, part of Ascension. So this is Alain Bouchard from um, Cardiology Specialist at Birmingham at St. Vincent, part of Ascension. And um, today we'd like to invite you to um, our podcast entitled Cardiac MRI. My co-host is Dr. Mustafa Ahmed, Director of uh, Cardiology Interventional and Structural Program at the University of Alabama in Birmingham. And our guest this week is Dr. David Fino, who is a cardiologist at the Shelby Baptist Medical Center. Gentlemen, welcome to our podcast. And I'd like to start with um, Dr. Fino. Uh, if you could give us maybe a, um, an idea of, uh, and a description of what is a cardiac MRI. Sure, sure. The um, way in which a cardiologist images the heart is almost as um, uh, detailed as the field of cardiology itself. So Renchen and almost a century ago described x-ray flat screen images of the heart, what we know today as plain film x-rays, and the field has just evolved. The field of cardiac imaging has evolved uh, exponentially since that time. Techniques that are quite well established uh, for the heart um, are ultrasound um, x-rays that I just mentioned, uh, nuclear cardiology, and these are our mainstays of the practice. And in, in x-rays, I would include uh, CT imaging, computed tomography. About 20 years ago, I was lucky enough to get involved with uh, MRI scanning of the heart, which we call CMR for short, cardiac magnetic resonance, CMR. And what MRI does is it offers very high resolution, three-dimensional images that do not require any type of radiation. So you have a very large magnetic field that excites a proton, but it can actually excite any element that has an odd mass number or an odd total weight number. And either of those things can be excited, imaged, and used for diagnostic purposes. And about 20, actually 25 years ago now, I was uh, privileged enough to be part of a big effort where we, we imaged the heart. It's a challenging organ to image with MRI because Uh, The MRI scanners are down in radiology. It's this long tube. It's this very high magnetic field for which many uh, things are uh, not allowed. Things like in the past, things like pacemakers, neural stimulators, insulin pumps. Um, And what you have to do to make images of the heart is you have to time or gate the scanner to an electrocardiogram. That's the um, blips that you see on the side of a emergency vehicle, for example. And if you can do that, and if you can have the patient hold their breath for 10 to 15 seconds at a time, you can fill the MRI images, what's called case space. And uh, thanks to a mathematical uh, function called the Fourier transform, you can make very beautiful dynamic images of the heart that look essentially anatomic. And what I mean by that is uh, you don't need any imagination to interpret an MRI. Whereas Nuclear images that I mentioned and ultrasound images, I I believe it takes a lot of skill to look at them and probably some imagination. The exact opposite is true with CMR. The pictures are near anatomic resolution. So there are different protocols to um, image patient. Um, What should we, what should the patient expect when they get into a cardiac MRI machine? And um, do they need to do any special type of preparation Sure. So the question is, uh, what should a patient expect prior to their CMR exam? The first thing to be aware of is uh, not all MRI scanners are created equally. There are open MRIs, half Tesla MRIs, one, 1.5, three Tesla, and even higher field MRIs. One Tesla is equal to 10,000 gauss for those of you who are physicists out there. And you just have to appreciate the incredible strength of this field. And when you have an MRI scanner that'll do cardiac, there's even more 
restrictions that are there due to something called a gradient set. And that's what allows you to make MRI images. So usually the MRI scanners that will do the heart are few and far between. Uh, for example, in the Birmingham area, there's really only two places that do more than about two of these a week, and that's UAB and Shelby Baptist. And the reason for Shelby Baptist is uh, luckily after seven years of uh, asking for it, they finally gave me a scanner. And UAB has a couple colleagues there, Steve Lloyd being one of them that does a very nice job with it. So they need to expect to go to a different part of the hospital. They need to expect to lay flat. And the key to making good images is holding your breath and trying to not move during the acquisition. Now, the MRI scanner is actually quite loud, and very often you need ear protection during the scan itself. And if you listen carefully, you can hear the scanner imaging as your heart beats. So you can expect that. MRI scans 25 years ago used to be one and a half to two hours each. These scans are down to 15 to 30 minutes at the most. Most likely you will receive an IV and images will be taken before and after a contrast dye called uh, gadolinium. Gadolinium is really the key to why cardiac MR is important today. And uh, once the images are done, the uh, radiation technologist will bring you out of the scanner and send you home. Prior to going in, they will have you remove um, probably some clothing, certainly anything metal, glasses, pens, earrings, necklaces. Uh, you'll have a detailed survey of whether you have any metal implants. And one of the things you have to ask our veterans is if they have shrapnel in their eyes or, or if they've been around an exploding grenade where they might have shrapnel in their eyes because there have been case reports of the MRI scan causing those to move and causing visual changes. And so then after that detailed assessment, you go in, you have your scan and you go on home. The uh, gadolinium is, is painless when it goes in. There's lots of uh, images that are taken. And then within one to three days, you should hopefully get a report from your cardiologist with the results. So uh, what does the gadolinium do, David? So uh, again, I was lucky enough to be part of uh, an original effort about 25 years ago that sought to find out that exact question, Elaine. So what gadolinium is, is it's a, um, a ferromagnetic contrast agent. What that means is you can see it on the MRI. It's about a thousand times as bright and causes protons to be about a thousand times as bright. The protons are, of course, um, naked hydrogen atoms. So water is H2O and H is a proton, and that's what your imaging with an MRI scan. So what gadolinium is, is it's chelated by a molecule. The original one was called DTPA, diethylene triamine penacetic acid. And the chelate means the gadolinium cannot enter intact cell membranes. So it goes into the body and stays in the uh, space that's outside of the cells called the extracellular space. So First and foremost, gadolinium is a marker of flow and can be used to image blood vessels, can be used to image organs and see where blood flow is. When a person has a part of the heart that dies, uh, what, what the research that I was involved with showed was that the cell membranes explode and that molecule, which normally would be outside of the cell, can now go inside of the cell. And it turns out the transit of that molecule going inside of the cell takes a long time. In fact, the gadolinium sits around in dead muscle for 20 minutes to an hour. So you really don't have to hurry the acquisition at all. And uh, the simple theme that I found out and that we uh, took part in this discovery was that these areas of the heart that get bright because of gadolinium are dead. And so the Three words that summarize my research are bright is dead and the corollary not bright is not dead. So gadolinium uh, lets us see what areas of the heart are alive or viable and what areas of the heart are dead or non-viable. You seem very much alive to me. Uh, not saying that you're not bright, but in, uh, in patients that don't have myocardial infarction um, and, but have maybe a critical uh, narrowing and uh, maybe have some heart muscle at risk or jeopardy, uh, can gadolinium and maybe in a combination, for example, of 
a denison or a Lexi scan maybe sometimes can be applied and look at um, you know, imaging and maybe in a better way that that the nuclear stress test does with higher resolution. Yeah. So uh, the short the short answer is no. <laughs> the uh, the pictures of the heart. So so one thing that you find out if you image all comers even people who have not had a heart attack or a myocardial infarction, as the three of us uh, call heart attacks, what you find out is that five to 10% of people out there have had a heart attack. And in fact, they didn't know anything about it. These so-called silent heart attacks. The other thing is lots of people who have a critical blockage to one of the three arteries that feed the heart, they have had a small degree of heart muscle that has died. So that's, those are two things off the bat that we should be aware of. Now, let's say the scenario that you're talking about, Dr. Bouchard, about you have a totally viable heart, not a single cell has died, and you have a 99% blockage, or you suspect there's a 99% blockage. What you can do is you can image that heart sequentially with the MRI scanner and follow a, an injection of gadolinium into the heart muscle. And very often at rest, gadolinium distributes evenly, even in the event of a 99% blockage. That's due to something called autoregulation. Now, if you can apply some form of stress, and you name two of them, um, adenosine and uh, persantine, uh, you can also do LexiScan and others are under investigation. But if you apply some form of stress, normal areas of the heart increase their flow by a factor of four. But the area that's jeopardized, that area subtended by that 99% blockage, unfortunately cannot increase flow. So uh, if you are able to do that stress test in the MRI scanner, you'll see a hole on that area during stress where you would have expected perfusion to be. Now, one of the other ways that you can stress the heart is with dobutamine and or with nitroglycerin. Now, it turns out that when we do that traditionally as cardiologists, usually that's more of a wall motion assessment. And once again, cardiac MR can provide beautiful assessments of wall motion before and after uh, physiological or uh, pharmacologic stress in the form of some sort of beta uh, receptor agonist such as dobutamine. So, um, you know, usually uh, uh, this is an education for me, um, really interesting to listen to all this. Usually when you go to uh, conferences, I've been to conferences in the past where one of your favorite sessions is getting an echocardiographer, a MRI specialist, a nuclear specialist, everyone in the same room and listening to everyone tell everyone the advantages and disadvantages and everyone says, of course, theirs is the best. And this is this is a good forum because there's no opposing strong specialists here, and I'd love to hear about the following. So p- when people talk about MRI, um, people like to talk about accuracy. Like if you really wanted to know, am I correct in saying, if you really wanted to know to the percentage point, to the milliliter, how much blood was inside the heart, how much was it able to pump, what what the function of the heart is, am I correct in saying, MRI is the best? And if so, what, why is that? What are some of the techniques used to make this so accurate? And what's the importance of being accurate also? Sure, Mustafa. So the, the question uh, Dr. Ahmed is asking is, is MRI an accurate technique? Is it possibly more accurate than other imaging modalities such as ultrasound or CT or um, X-ray angiography or nuclear medicine? And if so, what does that accuracy get you? I mean, is it is it is it a useful thing? So first of all, the answer to the first question is yes, it is more accurate. There's a couple of reasons MRI is more accurate, but the basic uh, fundamental reason that MRI scanning is more accurate than ultrasound and nuclear imaging, for example, has to do with something called voxel size, voxel size. And a voxel is a three-dimensional pixel And the achievable voxel size with the standard of care nuclear medicine imaging is about a centimeter, one centimeter in each direction. A centimeter is about a third of an inch. So that voxel size is interpolated. It's mathematically operated on. And those are the pictures that we see for our stress tests. With ultrasound, we're at 
a resolution of something like half uh, or a quarter of what I just mentioned. With MRI scans, the voxel size is sub-millimeter. So a millimeter is one-tenth of a centimeter. And in fact, it's one-tenth of a centimeter in all directions, depending on how you acquire the images. So the short answer to the first part is MRI scanning is more accurate. Now, CT scanning is quite accurate as well. It has very good uh, voxel size. Unfortunately, the more times you do it, the more times you irradiate the patient. So with an MRI scanner, if you have a question, you can do another image without that cost of radiation. Now, the, the question has, is and always has been actually, what does that improvement in resolution get you? Why, why spend $5,000, for example, for a cardiac MRI when you can do an echo for $500? What really does it get you? For a long time, it didn't get you anything. It was just a beautiful echocardiogram. And the honest truth is that You can use it for different purposes, but nobody really figured out what you can use it for. A guy named Pinnell, Dudley Pinnell, out of the uh, Royal Brompton Institute in London, in the late 90s, early 2000s, demonstrated that you can get a measurement of cardiac mass, the actual mass of the heart, that is so accurate compared to uh, necropsy specimens, specimens after the subject has passed away that you really have no question on what that mass is at a point in time and how it changes over time and how a heart changes over time is referred to as ventricular remodeling. Now, one of the things you can use that accuracy for Mustafa is if you're studying a drug such as an ACE inhibitor or a beta blocker or an aldosterone antagonist. And the whole point of these drugs is to affect left ventricular remodeling, is to affect the way the heart changes after time. And what Dr. Pinnell showed was that the sample size that you need to study that particular question, any one of those drugs, is something like one-tenth or even one-fiftieth of what you need if you use ultrasound or one of those other imaging modalities. And the reason is the accuracy that you get with the MRI scan can uh, help to reduce the inaccuracies that you get with the other scans so you can actually answer the question, what is the change in mass, does it get better, and so on and so forth. Uh, A second thing that you can do with the uh, cardiac MRI, MRI imaging is if it's an important question, you can figure out, something that's very important to you, Dr. Bouchard, and to you, Dr. Ahmed. And that is, before I intervene on that 99% blockage, is it alive or is it dead? And it's such a simple question, yet we do not routinely do it. And it's very curious to find out that some patients who don't recover after a stent or who don't recover after a bypass well, guess what? It was dead to begin with. And it doesn't matter how well you revascularize it. It doesn't matter how many bypasses you put into it. If it's not alive, it ain't going to recover. And so that, I think, that accuracy translates to that part as well, because you can't just say sometimes whether it's alive or dead. There are gradations of alive and dead. It turns out that the heart dies from the inside out. And it turns out that sometimes you have enough alive tissue that you will predict it recovers. So those are the two big applications. It turns out there are hundreds more, Dr. Ahmed, but great question. That's a very, very good point. We yeah. uh, Remember, we did, um, most people to look at viability will do maybe a thallium stress test sometimes with tomography and have, you know, or, or sometimes we'll do a PET, you know, scan. Um, which allows for viability, but they, these are very expensive devices, not available, you know, at all centers. Um, I remember looking, I think your point is very well taken, you know, to do it in a cardiac MRI, to be able to see how much of the damage is there. And you can actually see the damage within the wall itself and, and describe, for example, where, where it was only a small amount of damage that was mostly located within the endocardium or the most inner portion of the heart muscle versus an infarct that has been transmural where the whole section of the heart muscle has been damaged. We did a study with Tim Henry uh, where we're looking at infarct size and, and uh, given stem cell uh, intracoronary 
and measure the uh, size of the infarct six months later, as well as a year later. The study was negative, uh, but it was really kind of interesting to me uh, to be able to kind of monitor these patients because a lot of these patients, as you said, have multiple coronary artery disease. You could see, for example, the, the infarct that they had in another location that was, you know, five years ago. You still can see it and quantify it. Now, there are some technical limitations. I mean, it's a very good image uh and you don't you don't have as much limitation maybe as some of the echoes but you're still dependent on motion artifact i mean it's difficult sometimes for the patient uh, to hold their breath uh you know for a good image or they move a little bit and it causes some artifact and plus we have patients that have had previous myocardial infarction uh that have cardiomyopathy or an enlargement or heart failure and have a defibrillator or a pacemaker how do we handle uh, cardiac MRI in those situations, uh, Dr. Fino? The superb questions, uh, Dr. Bouchard. Um, the, the question is, the question I think that you're summarizing is, what are some of the limitations of CMR and what do we need to be concerned about if, if there are clinicians out there, internists, family practice doctors, who, who want to order these on their patients and or if patients decide they themselves are, would like one, or if they they think one of their ill family members should get one. The other, you, you mentioned uh, implanted devices like defibrillators and pacemakers, okay? And then um, we also need to consider whether these patients have underlying kidney disease, because unfortunately, uh, we now know that the gadolinium agents have a chance of uh, systemic sclerosis, which is a bad disease if you are uh, in renal failure. Um, and then we need to consider a couple of other practical matters, which uh, I will discuss right now. So the first thing to realize is that tremendously sick patients, people on adrenaline drips or an equivalent drug, or people who are mechanically ventilated in the ICU, for example, probably should not get a cardiac MRI. And one of the reasons for that is the MRI scanner is often in another part of the hospital. It's away from the critical care nurses. And it's just not a safe place to have a cardiac arrest. So if patient is too sick or unstable, it's probably not a good idea for them to get an MRI scan. A second thing is, is if they have an implantable device. Now, these would include pacemakers and defibrillators, but uh, more uh, uh, devices also exist and other than cardiology devices like pacers and defibrillators, but there are deep brain stimulators. There are aortic stents down in the abdomen, there are insulin pumps, uh, there are pain pumps, and each of these devices has something called an MRI safety protocol published by a guy named Shellock, Frank Shellock. And the safety of these devices or lack of safety can all be looked up online at Dr. Shellock's website, S-H-E-L-L-O-C-K. And what you find out is many of these devices, even though they have metal in them, many of them are perfectly safe in the MRI scanner. But for example, in the case of deep brain stimulators, you really have to be careful putting them in the MRI scanner. It can really cause some bad things. So you got to look over what uh, devices they have. Now, practically speaking, in order for the cardiac MRI to provide good information, they really need to get gadolinium, period. That is the way you get a good scan. So if their kidney function is abnormal, it may be worth a call to a radiologist and or to a nephrologist, a kidney specialist, or an imaging specialist to discuss what are the risks and benefits of gadolinium in those patients. And typically, I've found that people with a kidney number, a creatinine number of two and lower, the MRI scan is perfectly safe. Now, when I was doing this 25 years ago, everybody got gadolinium and nobody cared. But the truth is a few of these patients probably develop a, who have kidney dysfunction, probably develop a possibly lethal consequence called systemic nephrogenic sclerosis. And it's bad news when it happens. Now, an additional consideration is whether or not the patient can tolerate the scan. And what I mean by that is two things. Can you lay flat? And it might not surprise any of you to know that I've literally laid in the MRI scanner 5,000 times. And it is extraordinarily claustrophobia inducing. So I'm not claustrophobic. And yet I was scared when I went in the first time. So can they lay flat? 
Do they have overwhelming claustrophobia? And maybe the most important thing, can they hold their breath for 10 to 15 seconds at a time and stay still? And all those things are just practical things that we have to get around if we're going to get these images. Now, things have been done. The MRI scanners have improved. And the, as I said a second ago, many of the devices are now MRI compatible, including pacemakers and defibrillators. But we have to understand the invention of the plane, which I think is the MRI, does not preclude the invention of the car, which I think is the uh, echo or ultrasound machine. So just because you have a plane, it might not be a good idea to travel 10 miles in it. It might be more practical to take a car. But if you're going to go across country, it might be better to take a plane. And you probably don't need to go across country every single day. So we can extend that analogy. Now, one more topic I'd like to mention that um, my co-host is mentioning to me is open MRIs. Open MRIs are are wonderful, uh, particularly for orthopedic indications, joints, backs, shoulders, arms, knees. Unfortunately, you can get images of the heart, but they just aren't very good. People have tried it. Um, There's another question about three Tesla higher field MRI scans. And unfortunately, the promise of 3T has not really panned out. Most of us prefer the regular 1.5 Tesla scanners. And so the the field is developing as we speak. But honestly, I'm, I'm lucky to say today that after working on it 25 years ago, Really, what we do today is a mature technology and uh, has its place in uh, modern-day cardiology. Yeah, you know, you talk about um, technology and development. I've seen some beautiful images recently of PET MRI scans with with overlay, looking at sarcoid and and metabolism. And it's amazing when you look at this. This looks like space-age stuff that you can't even – and like you say, what's amazing about technology is the more you do, the more obvious it becomes just to look at. So this, the technology is exponentially, I'm sure, complex, but the visual imagery is just beautiful and just very self-explanatory of, as we kind of move forward. Um, you know, I'll talk for a few minutes about some of the structural applications of MRI scanning. And so as a valve specialist, um, I had asked you that question before about why does it matter to be accurate? And so a couple of situations uh, where it might matter uh, is in valve disease. So you've got two options. Right now, there's no good medicines for valve disease. And when your valve is uh, affected, you it's a mechanical issue and you have to fix it. But unlike taking a tablet, having a surgical procedure uh, on your heart valve where your heart is stopped to um, to fix that is a, is a big deal. And so when is the timing of going and intervening on a valve? And if we look at the a leaky mitral valve, for example, you could go in and operate on it, or you could watch and wait a little bit longer. And as you watch and wait, the, the key feature, if you choose that strategy, is to know when the heart's getting bigger and to know when the heart is remodeling, like you said. And I can tell you that um, for, in structural heart disease, MRI is currently, I'd go as far as to say the standard for extraordinarily accurate images to see if the leak is getting uh any worse in terms of the effect it's having on the heart or if the heart itself is getting any bigger, I would argue you could pick that up on an MRI scan uh, quicker than you could in most uh, other imaging modalities. And it's, uh, and it's uh, for that reason. Now, one time uh, I'd, I'd love you to comment on this, uh, Dr. Fino is one time that this becomes, I guess, more nuanced is athletes hearts versus non-athletes' hearts. For example, if you get a marathon runner, their heart might look a bit odd if a normal cardiologist looks, just looked at it, or sports players. And and when you're screening people to go and be able to do sports and go and be okay with that, or for physical examinations or just medical exams, um, do you get much of that? Where Because that's MRI has a huge use in that, which is differentiating pathological conditions from just physiologic conditions. Would you Would you care to comment on that a little? Uh, absolutely, Mustafa. I'm, I'm having a hard time keeping up all the things I want to talk about uh, that you just mentioned, so I'm going to try to go through them one by one. Um, I don't want to be here to tell you that MRI replaces every other thing. Not at all. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in the technology, and I know that it's underutilized. Um, with regard to the first topic that you brought up about valvular heart disease, while I love 
MRI and CMR in particular. I really think that the best pictures of the valves come from some of your work, Mustafa, which is the 3D echo and the TEE. And the fact is it's real time, it's portable, it's it's relatively non-invasive, it can be used to guide interventions. And I think that's really where our main workhorse comes from. And it's actually from the ultrasound literature that I think we're starting to get at the exact answer to the question that you're talking about, which is, what do we do with these complex valve patients? What in the world do we do? How do we figure out when to operate? And how do you figure out, Mustafa, when to operate? And which of these ventricles is going to do well after the operation? And as far as I can tell, the answer to that between compensated and decompensated, when you can wait a while and when you need to fix the valve, has to do with the intramyocardial forces. It has to do with the stress and strain, the forces inside of the heart muscle itself. And that's where I think ultrasound is really teaching us a lot and may predict who is going to do well with a valve procedure, who's decompensating. And that exact measurement can also be, in principle, determined from CMR. It's not there yet, but I believe that's the future. Second uh, point that you mentioned is in the evaluation of athletes. And that sort of also dovetails into what we call risk stratification in, in cardiology. So if you take a group of people, which of them is likely to develop a complication, a heart attack, stroke, problem with their heart, and which one is probably less likely? So there was a study that addressed this called the MESA trial, M-E-S-A, And unfortunately, the answer to that question is not obvious. And it's unfortunately probably not predicted by CMR. But there are a couple of specific conditions that CMR can really provide useful information for. And I know that all the doctors out there deal with these. But when you have an athlete who has an unusual right side of their heart called the right ventricle, you have to think about a condition called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, which is a condition associated with sudden death in athletes. And that can be exactly accurately characterized on a CMR. There's another condition called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And these are the kids that are unfortunately dying suddenly on the basketball court, on the football court. And that is a condition that 100% can be characterized on the MRI. And you can tell the exact point at which the pathologic enlargement of the heart actually outgrows the blood supply. And that, in my opinion, is when the condition becomes high risk. It's exactly at that point. For obvious reason, the heart is actually causing itself a heart attack. And that can be elucidated with the gadolinium imaging that I mentioned And there are actually studies demonstrating that the high-risk hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients are the ones that have delayed enhancement on their scans. Uh, A third group of patients that I'll mention is what cardiologists call the athlete's heart. Uh, I'm privileged that I had the opportunity to, I have the opportunity to take care of kids. So all the athletes at Thompson High School have to come to see me. And I also uh, took care of the coaches, the offensive line and the defensive line of the uh, Birmingham semi-professional football team. And what you find with these guys is it's interesting. They have enlargement of their hearts. And how do you distinguish when it's normal enlargement and due to them being extraordinary athletes versus when it becomes pathological? And I think the answer to that question is not simple, but it must start with, what is the actual size of the heart? And that uh, dovetailing into the previous um, discussion of the accuracies of MR, I think that can be accurately characterized. And so the way I approach these patients is often with the regular stuff, ultrasound of the heart, treadmill testing to look for bad rhythms of the heart. And then very often I'll get a cardiac MRI on them to to characterize other features of their heart. And based on that, I will provide them with some kind of a risk assessment. Um, In my experience, 
the thing that nobody discusses with these athletes is something called commotio cortis, which is a, which is independent of anything we've talked about today. It's when a direct blow to the heart, uh, such as a strike to the chest in karate or with a helmet, uh, with somebody in football actually lands on a particular part of the EKG and it actually stops the heart. And I discuss that risk with every one of my, uh, pre athletic sports protocols. So uh, I hope that answers your question, Dr. Ahmed, but it, 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 the, the more detail you can have of the characterization of the heart, I believe the better an answer we can give these athletes. One practical question uh, pertaining to just ordering the test. So if you want to order an MRI scan, say from your office or from the hospital for someone, um, is it as easy, easy to order as an echo? Can you just order it? What, what are the, do you have to be uh, streamlined with the indications and, what is the expense uh, in terms of insurance or both to a patient? What are the practical issues of actually ordering? I can tell you, uh, practically speaking, uh, it seems to me there might be a few more loops to jump through and it's a bit harder to do. I might be wrong. I mean, you guys you guys are ordering these routinely and performing them. What do you think about that? So, the, Dr. Ahmed, those are perfect questions to ask. Uh, the, the question I believe to summarize is, what are the practical limitations if a doctor decides they want an MRI scan of the heart? Is it easy to order? Is it readily available? And what limitations, financial and otherwise, might a patient encounter? So the MRI scanner is fundamentally not portable and not available. And by MRI scanner, I mean MRI scanner with the cardiac protocol and with a tech who, is, who knows how to do it correctly. Uh, unfortunately, it's as complex to do a cardiac MRI as it is to do all the other MRI scans put together. So not every tech knows how to do it, even if the software's there. So you have to have a well-trained tech. And then another thing you have to have is someone at the institution who reads CMR. And myself and uh, Steve Lloyd and um, a nice guy named Ricardo Bracer there at Princeton – we're the only ones in the Birmingham area who read these things. So, uh, oh, Himanshu Gupta reads them too. And so the likelihood of having those three things, an MRI scanner with the software package, a tech who's trained to do it, and someone who can read it is low to begin with. So once you've gotten past that, the MRI scanner is not portable like an ultrasound, and it's not universally available like a nuclear stress test scanner is. It tends to be here and there. Uh, at different medical centers. And so when you order it, in general, the Blue Cross Blue Shield and Medicare have certain acceptable indications. And one of those indications is an abnormal echo. So if someone finds something abnormal, enlargement or left ventricular hypertrophy, chamber dilatation, abnormal valvular function, and don't forget abnormal thoracic aorta, all of these things can be reasons for a CMR. And sometimes you have to jump through the hoops. My biggest indication for me to order, and I probably order more than anybody, is to look for viability, to answer the question, which parts of the heart are alive and which parts of the heart are dead? And that seems to get reported pretty frequently. I would say of the 150 scans that I've ordered in the last couple, three years, I would say that fewer than 1% of them have been denied and another fewer than 1% have patients just not been able to get through it. Um, it's uh, practically speaking, the scans are quick and the imaging data is relative readily available and viewable on a PAX workstation on a post-processing station. It used to be when, when uh, Elaine and I were just starting in this field not only were the scans not available, but it was impossible to look at your images because not very many software packages could be used to look at them, Mustafa. So today, a lot of those hurdles have been overcome. And, uh, you know, just by way of advertisement, you know, if, if someone needs a, uh, a cardiac MRI scan here in the Birmingham area, Princeton has a wonderful program. UAB has a wonderful program. And Shelby Baptist, part of the Brookwood Baptist system, has them. And uh, all of these centers will be sure to get the MRI scan done, treat the patient. And then the most important thing, give the referring cardiologist a phone call and tell them the answer. 
Thank you. So let's see, David, um, you know, your center has uh, obviously ECHO, has the nuclear, has a, a 256 a CT, um, and you're the cardiologist and feel like, you know, it feels like it would be a more complete cardiac evaluation or or uh, a more complete uh, a spectrum of imaging that you can do. What, what do you use? What do you say to them to justify, hey, look, I think we need, we have an MRI already. All we need is to get that software to get the heart. What do you tell your administrator to convince them that uh, having cardiac MRIs uh, can be helpful in our patients? So, Dr. Bouchard, that's a wonderful question uh, that I, I'm actually going to dovetail into our conversation before we got on air today, uh, which is which is what is the role of a surgical cardiologist and what what does that mean exactly? And so the question that Dr. Bouchard is asking is, let's say you have a center in a prominent city and they have all the other bells and whistles. They have the 3D echo, which is an ultrasound modality, and they have a, a 256 slice CT, which is your best possible x-ray scenario. And just for argument's sake, let's say they have a PET scanner, which is the best possible nuclear medicine scanner. Why in the world would you shell out the 5 million to go ahead and uh, get a dedicated cardiac MR scanner with all the bells and whistles? And the answer is, is actually pretty simple. And that is all those other imaging techniques are wonderful but you really can't tell what part of the heart is alive and what part is dead. And the thing is, I think the, the, the hosts of this show can tell you that our patients are getting sicker and sicker and sicker. And unfortunately, our outcomes are being looked at more and more and more closely. And has it ever occurred to you that it might be we're missing something on these patients that predicts which one of them are going to do well with your stent, Dr. Bouchard, or which one of them are going to do well with your valve, Dr. Ahmed? And I think that part of that answer is very simply, is the heart alive or is it dead? And without that information, we can look at things, we can look at wall motion by ultrasound, may or may not be alive or dead. We can look at perfusion defects by nuclear. These are full of artifacts. I mean, honest to God, I can barely see the heart on those things. And we can look at coronary anatomy on a CT scanner, but thank you. We do that every day in the cath lab. And thanks to radial catheterization, which which I perform also, the risk is really minimal. I mean, next to zero, honestly. So if you want to accurately assess these patients going for high-risk bypass surgery, going for high-risk valve procedures, going for um, implants of defibrillators and complex electrical procedures, I believe part of that answer lies very simply in which parts of the heart are alive and which parts are dead. And so the short answer is, Dr. Bouchard, have them call me and uh, I'll be happy to make that happen for you. <laughs> Sounds good. I may take you up on this. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to you know, thank you very much. Cardiac MRI uh, providing incredible anatomy as well as function and characterization of the heart muscle uh, without any ionizing um, radiation and therefore completely non-invasive. It can be repeated and follow a patient over a long period of time with repeated uh, imaging uh, without um, uh, any damage or any harm to our patient, which is the bottom line. This is what we strive for. Dr. Fino, Dr. Ahmed, thank you very much uh, for this wonderful session and podcast on cardiac MRI. Thank you all.